like this. <laughs> the challenges of uh, getting new glasses and bifocals for the first time. I feel like a bobblehead this week because I don't know where to go. And if you go too quick, because I have astigmatism, if you go too quick, you can't see anything. <laughs> if you get my eyes a second, I'm in slow motion now. Well, I was sitting there trying to decide what to read because it's all so good. <laughs> Darn it. How do you pick just a few? Um, I'm in Hebrews chapter 12. Again, in the Message Bible, I just think it's an interesting perspective, something different that maybe not everybody's heard, so I always love to hear um, what, what it has to say. I'm going to start at the beginning, and then I'm going to jump to the end. Uh, discipline in a long-distance race. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through. That will shoot adrenaline into your souls. In this all-out match against sin, others have suffered far worse than you to say nothing of what Jesus went through, all that bloodshed. So don't feel sorry for yourselves, or have you forgotten how good parents treat children and that God regards you as his children? God is educating you. That's why you must never drop out. He's treating you as dear children. This trouble you're in isn't punishment. It's training, the normal experience of children. We're in this world, right? Only irresponsible parents leave children to fend for themselves. Would we prefer an irresponsible God? We respect our own parents for training and not spoiling us, so why not embrace God's training so we can truly live? While we were children, our parents did what seemed best to them, but God is doing what is best for us, training us to live God's holy best. At the time, discipline isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off handsomely, for it's the well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. And then I'm going to jump down to the, an unshakable kingdom. So what is this race we're running, right? It's the unshakable kingdom. Unlike your ancestors, you didn't come to Mount Sinai, all that volcanic, volcanic blaze and earth-shaking earth rumble to hear God speak. The ear-splitting words and soul-shaking message terrified them, and they begged him to stop. When they heard the words, if an animal touches the mountain, it's as good as dead, they were afraid to move. Even Moses was terrified. No, that's not your experience at all. You've come to Mount Zion, the city where the living God resides. The invisible Jerusalem is populated by throngs of festive angels and Christian citizens. It is the city where God is judged with judgments that make us just. We've come to Jesus, who presents us with a new covenant, a fresh charter from God. He isn't the mediator of this covenant. The murder of Jesus, unlike Abel's, a homicide that cried out for vengeance, became a proclamation of grace. So don't turn a deaf ear to those gracious words. If those who ignored earthly warnings didn't get away with it, what will happen to us if we turn our backs on heavenly warnings? His voice that time shook the earth to its foundations. This time, he told us this quite plainly, he'll also rock the heavens. One last shaking from the top to the bottom, stem to stern. The phrase one last shaking means a thorough house cleaning, getting rid of all the historical and religious junk so that the unshakable essentials stand clear and uncluttered. Do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before God. For God is, an indifferent, is not an indifferent bystander. He's actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn, and he won't quit until it's all cleansed, 
God himself is fire. And the good news is that our God is a consuming fire, but he doesn't destroy, he transforms. Our God makes all things new. Our God is a God of life and health and peace and joy and the things that are destroyed are the things that are not joy, peace, and love and the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, again, in this world, we're in this world. Things are not perfect in this world. Our bodies are not perfect. Our minds are not perfect. Our, our jobs are not perfect. The people around us are not perfect. Although some of us, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the only perfection we know in this life is Jesus Christ. Amen. That is the only perfection we can hope and trust in is Jesus Christ. And the unshakable kingdom. And when we need a boost of adrenaline to our souls, look to him. He is the source of the strength that gets us through when we're weary. He is the source of our peace when everything around us is a mess. He is the, the, the thing that keeps us running the race, that gets us back on our feet when we stumble. When we get distracted, he is the one that helps us to focus on what is really important. As we enter a season of thanksgiving, be thankful with thankful hearts it pleases God when we just say thank you when we worship him because he deserves our worship because he is so worthy and I'm thankful for every one of you thankful for our pastor thankful for our wonderful worship leader and all of you that come together and make this a house of worship house of prayer so be encouraged in Jesus name Anybody have any prayer requests or any testimonies like share you anything?
That's wonderful. It, it lifts you up. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you hope. It gets it, it out into the, yes. into the world so yes. that it can become a reality and bring back to you what God's you know, wanting you to. So it's not just about speaking it. Sing it. Yeah. 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 Well, and, fi- and scientifically, a sung sound versus a spoken sound rings like exponentially more the vibrations there's something that happens when we sing to the to the power that comes out of our mouth it is more powerful when we sing it's amazing yeah don you know we have to make conscious choices in this regard and this is something that we've talked about and buried he said this So however horrible mm-hmm. the situation is, God said it would not be more than I could bear. Yeah. I either believe that right. or I reject that and then whatever, you know, I, I've lost I've lost something if I if I believe the enemy that he and he's done it through all of us. You know, there's a point out there where I'm gonna get you. You're gonna, there'll be a weakness, there'll be something, and I will be, if, if, if I'm the only one that's happened to, then, you know, God bless, because it's a horrible feeling. Yeah. But there again is when you start letting your imagination right. elevate right. themselves. So I have to fall back to that verse. I will never let more come upon me yes. than you can bear. Yeah. That's right. And if I, that makes me just cast all of it onto him. Yep. Where, which is what he said to do. Yep. And then I can walk away from it. Right. What seemed unbearable, I don't even have to deal with. Yeah. And I think so many times that this is what I, I'm trying to get my kids, my grandkids, my, my wife, myself. I mean, I'm telling you what, we are locked in a mortal battle. Yeah. But That's God true. said, just trust me. Yes. I talked to my cousin yesterday. told me she said she's a, a real good Christian, whatever that means. You know? I mean, she believes. Right. She trusts the Lord. But she chose to go through chemo, and we talked about it. And I said, well, you know, I've chosen to have open heart surgery. Right. So I'm not condemning anybody that takes a medical way out. But she told me yesterday, she said, you know, I'm really thinking I'm going to stop the chemo. And I said, well, you know what? I'll just have to tell you what I would tell myself. We have promises that you don't need to take it. If we believe. And I said, you know, I said, go to Hebrews 11. Read it. Paul said, those are examples for us. There's nothing they did that we should not be able to do. But we live in a a world, you know, we were just chatting. I said, look, we live in a world where Everything you attain in this world is at your effort. Right. We send right. our kids to school. We, we went to school ourselves. We train ourselves to have a good job. Why? Because if you don't, you're left in the dust. You've got to work. Everything you get here, you work for it. And I said, Linda, in the kingdom of God, it's exactly the opposite. Amen. And that is where the problem is because it's yeah. alien to us. Yeah. Yeah. It's so alien to just expect to get something for nothing you do. <clears throat> because we're humans. And I said, so don't feel bad that you, you know, and then, then I explained to her about the fact that God, contrary to us, again, can forgive and forget. Yes, yes. that's right. Now I said, you and I, we can forgive somebody. Yes. Let's face it, it's impossible to erase it out of our mind. It cannot be but I said, thank God. Yes. We can stand before him and he can look at us as absolutely, you know, yeah. as white as the driven snow, just pure. No, no, nothing wrong because he can forget. Amen. Yeah. He forgives our iniquity and, yes. and remembers our sin no more. No more. Yes. 
Stand and go to the Lord this morning. I want to thank oh. Joey for sharing what she shared because God's been building. Lord, 
Lord, that you know our heart's desire, Lord, to see your kingdom come to this world, Lord, to see the promises in your word unfold to the people around us, to our friends, our family, our co-workers. Lord, that our shadows would heal as in the days of your disciples, Lord. Lord, that the miracles that have come from you, Lord, are just commonplace, that we are supernatural, new creation, a new creation, Lord, formed by the power of your blood. Lord, in the word of our testimony, Lord, let the testimonies come forth for your glory, Lord. I thank you, Lord, as we remember Psalm 91, Lord. Under the shadow of your wing is our resting place. Under the shadow of your wing is where we come to you to whisper in your ear and to be held by you, Lord. It's where our, our hearts are calm. It's where our hearts are full of love and peace and joy. That we run to you, Lord, that we will not walk away as Jerusalem did. When you call us, Lord, we will come near to you. And we trust that you are our strength and our shield and our rear guard, Lord that nothing will come against us, Lord. That though a thousand may fall on our right to our left, Lord, it cannot come nigh our houses, our families, our friends, Lord. I thank you that you never leave us, you never forsake us, that we are to have no fear, no fear, for you are greater. You are greater, Lord, and you are powerful. And we worship you this morning, Lord. We lift you up and magnify your name, Jesus, the name above all names. We put our hope and our trust in you. Oh, be with us as we meet this morning in Jesus' name. Uh, we have the calendar back there on the little table to sign up for children's ministry. Um, we are going to have a, a, a birthday party for Jesus for the kids on uh, December 21st, the last Sunday before Christmas. So we'll have a little party for them then. So bring all the kids if you're around. Uh, December 5th, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Gate House of Prayer. Uh, the Lord gave me this uh, early this morning involving Eastern Gate. <clears throat> I know uh, people, a lot, of, a lot of people see this as a small church, a small gathering. Anyway, he gave me Ecclesiastics 9, 14, 15a. Um, there was a little city, and there were few men within it. There came a great king against it and besieged it and built a great bulwark against it. Now there was found in it a poor white man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. This city will be delivered Amen. by this poor little church. <laughs> but we have God's wisdom. Yes, we do. We have God's wisdom. He'll give us the strategies. Amen. Um, he'll give us the ways to yeah. maneuver through what the enemy is causing for destruction in this city. Amen. Come with us. Pray with us. Yeah. Stand with us. Yeah. The Lord will reveal the more that come, the more revelation comes forth. Amen. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Iron sharpening iron. A piece of iron can't sharpen itself. <laughs> it needs at least another piece of iron. Amen. Amen. And we are having our Christmas gathering. We're going to do a soup, soup and side, whatever that means to you, luncheon. Um, do we have a sign-up sheet in the back? Okay, there's a sign-up sheet in the back, so bring your favorite soup or a side or whatever. Um, December, Sunday, December 14th. All right. Praise the Lord. Let's speak the word this morning. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law, therefore I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. 
Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created to function, and I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Uh, let's see, uh, John and uh, Don, you two want to come take the offering this morning? Don. <laughs> Don, you want to ask the blessing, please? Things were being spoken a lot to me today. I even had an awesome dream. Uh, I talked to Tammy about it earlier today. I'll share later on. I don't want to spend a lot of time. Just awesome time with a major worship leader uh, in a different region speaking about what the Lord has done in our lives. <clears throat> but I know there's the enemy's trying to jack with our minds and trying to take back land that we have taken back and that we are midst in the taking more land back. <clears throat> there are many wineskins, old wineskins with old wine in them that are just sitting off the sidelines in the church and aren't taking the authority that the Lord had once given them and using it. And it's sad because those are the people that would be sitting right over there, I believe, right now. We're going to call you back in Jesus' name. We're going to call you back in Jesus' name. There's a pouring going on. There's a pouring going on. And I see the Lord birthing a new wineskin within the old wineskin. And as 
the new wineskin is expanding and filling up, it's going to burst the outer wineskin and dissolve the outer wineskin. The old wine's going to be gone. I'm seeing that right now. We're calling it out. To back that up, the Lord gave me Isaiah 56, 9 and 10. And all the beasts of the field come to devour you, all you beasts of the field. His watchmen are blind, and they are ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Took me right to John 16, 1 through 4a. And he said, these things I have spoken to you, that ye not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time is cometh that whoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things they will do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember, you may remember that I have told you of them. Calling out to the north and the south and the east and the west, the old wineskins have a revelation to be birthed in them right now. We will not give up. His sacrifice is done. The kingdom is now here within all of you. The kingdom is now to be birthed. And as revelation goes on, even in the midst of worship, if God is laying something on your heart, it's not up to us to go through a rack of songs just ratcheting it off. I don't do that. If I hear the Lord speaking through you, we will stop and listen to the Lord. Because he is in the quiet times. He is in the storm times. He is in the loud times and he is in the quiet times. Let us have an ear to hear. Because he can talk through Addie. He can talk through Don. He's no respecter of persons. Okay? I saw Kennedy healing somebody yesterday. In my spirit eye, she walked to somebody, and they were healing, and it was a lower back pain. I'm experiencing lower back pain right now, but it's not me who's having it. There's someone in here. Is somebody experiencing lower back pain right now? You are? Okay. As we're worshiping, those that are being led by the Lord, and even if Kennedy, that's up to Grandma, that's her decision, come and lay hands on you. The healing is coming. The healing is now. The healing is now. Receive it right now. The main thing is for us to worship him yes. in the midst of this. We're in his presence. There's fullness of joy. More and more in his presence, the healing is there. So why stay here? Let's just go there. Okay? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There it goes. <laughs> History split by sacrifice. God's perfect son gave up his life to ransom back the lost and bound, paying a price. And as he was broken, and he was broken, our judgment lifted, our sins acquitted.
sea was broken, heaven was open, our judgment lifted, our sins acquitted, His loving kindness freely divides us into the realm of grace.
Protect them in the field as they run free. As they run free right now. Let them call out to you, Lord, and celebrate your faithfulness. Freedom in worshiping you, Lord. Freedom and worshiping you, Lord.
And you will never change And I will celebrate your name Celebrate your name Help me sing song to the Lord. Sing a new song to the Lord. Lift up your voice and glorify and magnify the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Listen to some scripture, some more scripture.
glory forever. Amen. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever. Amen. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Praise God. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Praise God. I said Wednesday night, everything in this relationship we have with God, please be seated, is about revelation. He is the God of lights, the Father of lights. Amen. We are children of light. And he says, so we should walk in the light as he is in the light. Anybody who thinks that they've got the answers, I got, I got a word for you this morning. There's more answers than we even have questions for. Amen? Amen. But he's giving us revelation because the great revelation is, Paul said, Christ in you the hope of manifestation. Christ manifesting in us so that the church really becomes the body of Christ, so that we grow up into the full stature of Jesus Christ. That's what's happening. That's what we're groaning for. That's what the whole earth groans for, is for the manifestation of the sons of God. We are. We need more revelation for manifestation. That's, that's the bottom line. That's what all this is about. It's not about more information. It's about more, more manifestation. Amen. And the only way we can manifest is by having the revelation of who we are in Christ, of our oneness with God. Amen. Think about it. Jesus said this about us. Yes. Have, have this kind of a mind, that you are equal with God. Now, that sounds like blasphemy for most of us coming from where we've come from. But the truth is, how can you be one with God and not be equal with God? This isn't about l diminishing God in any way, shape, or form. It's about what God has done to elevate us, to make us children of God. Not servants, but heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can ever do greater works than he did. We have to have the same kind of revelation that Jesus had. Jesus was a man, but he was filled with the Spirit of God. He was a man, just he was no different than you and I, except without sin. We got born again. We are identical now to that Jesus, to that man, Jesus, that's filled with the Holy Spirit, sinless, without spot. Amen? Amen. That's what God says. That's not my opinion. That's not just my interpretation. That's what the Bible says over and over and over and over. And until we come into that full knowledge of what God has done, we're not going to do what God says we are to do, what we are capable of doing, what our mandate is to do as children of God. Raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons. Yes, we've had some sporadic and inconsistencies doing it, and we rejoice with every time we see success. But how often, how many times have we failed to come up to the full stature of Christ? Amen. These are the last days, believe me. If they aren't, there are last days anyhow. Yes. Praise the Lord. We're only going to live so long, whether the Lord returns or, and takes us out of here. Well, either way, we're, we're in our last days. 
And because of that, we have a promise from God that in the last days, these signs will follow. So think about it. Make these the last days. I don't mean that your life has to end tomorrow. I'm saying make these the days where God arises and His enemies are scattered. Amen. God's not going to arise and show up over here, Jesus popping up here and Jesus popping up there. He's going to arise in us and scatter the enemy. Amen. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. God bless you guys. Amen. And give the worship team a hand. Praise the Lord. They do great work for the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Okay, the Sunday school kids, you can, you can be dismissed. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Now, with all of the testimonies, and thank, every, thank you, everybody, who uh, shared a word with the, with the rest of us this morning. I was blessed by it, and I can say that more than blessed, I needed it, praise the Lord. Uh, you know, we, like Don was saying, like so many others, uh, you know, we, we all get to the end of ourselves multiple times in this life. Thank God that he's there when we get to the end of ourselves, if we know that he is. But, uh, you know, it's so easy for us to just pick up and do what we have been doing because we can do it. You know what I mean? You just, you know, what we say, just uh, bite the bullet or, you know, keep a stiff upper lip and, and uh, just hold on and things will get better. But there are times when things don't get better, they get worse. I mean, in the natural. And after a while, you just get wore out. You know, you just get to where you're saying, like Suzanne said and others, you know, you just go, where? You know, Jody was saying, where are you, Lord? Where's the promise? Where's the, you know what I mean? This is not, a, I'm not trying to expose a lack of faith here. I'm just saying this is the reality. And, and if we're honest, all of us get there at some point. Maybe not as often as others, but everybody gets to a place where you just feel like, come on. I think it's past time here. I think I know by now that this is when something ought to be happening. But a lot of that is because of us. Because we don't have the revelation that we really need to have of our identity. Of who we are and what we are in Christ. We tend to go to the fail safe. You know, back to the kind of the backup plan which is me. You know, I just won't give in to this. I just, I'm just not going to let it overcome me. I'll just tough it out. You know, I'll just, you know, I'll get through it. But, you know, you, you, can, you can fool other people. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln said it, but you can't fool all the people. All the, the one thing you can't fool is God and you. Yeah. You know, you know when you're just yeah. putting the smile on for everybody. Yeah. But inside, you know, you're going, this is insane. This is just bad. And that's the way the enemy works. He just lies, he lies, he lies, he lies, he lies, and he just keeps coming with it. And, uh, and sometimes we allow his words, his invectives, you know, to become elevated above what the Word of God says, simply because we get trapped in this natural realm and forget. So that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, and I appreciate everybody that shared because everybody fed into what, the Lord's been talking to me about here for the last week. Wednesday night, that's what we were dealing with, but I'm, I'm moving on from there. We, there's revelation for us in everything in this word, and we've got to get past the fear of, just like I said, there's a lot of times we've, we've read scriptures like that in, in Philippians where it just makes us uncomfortable. I mean, I don't know about you, but it made me uncomfortable for a long time to think, like, am I reading this right? That it's not that I should have the same mind of Christ that I can be equal with God? How can that be when everything that we are taught is that we are these no good sinners, saved by grace, but still no good sinners, and that somehow, you know, God is able to, uh, you know, not look at our sin or not see our sin, and and 
even though it's still there. You know what I mean? So that's what I want to talk about. Let's, let's begin with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll read verses 3 through 5. And I'll try to move along here so I don't keep you late. Praise the Lord. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What I want you to notice here, it's every thought to not to your obedience, but to the obedience of Christ. In other words, every time the enemy comes against you, you move from you to the obedience of Christ. Not your lack of obedience or your obedience, but you move always to that state to that standard, to that anchor, to that core truth, which is it's about his obedience, what he did, not about me. Because otherwise, the enemy can do exactly what I just got through talking about, and that is exalt imaginations, fears, anxieties, stress, all that stuff above the word of God. Praise the Lord. Now, the spiritual war is in essence a... A battle between truth and error. That's the, that's the bottom line. That's the, the commonest denominator here in everything that the enemy does. It's always what's true and what's not true. What's truth and what's error. That's the battle we fight constantly. Amen. All the time. It's fought against the world's philosophies that we are inundated with every single day through the newspaper, through the media, through everything else, and even religion has its philosophies. Amen? Praise God. And what they do, those philosophies of the world and of religion itself, raise themselves up against the true knowledge of God. Not just a knowledge or an awareness of God, but the knowledge of God, the knowledge God has. That's what we need. I, don't, I need more than a knowledge of God. The devil believes. But he has no revelation or he would not have crucified the king of glory. He wouldn't have messed with us if he, if he really understood. So he doesn't have revelation. He has some knowledge, no doubt, because he's lived all this time. He's, he's been around all this time. We need a knowledge, the knowledge of God, not a knowledge of God, but the knowledge of God. That's what God's trying to give us, and the only way you can get that is through revelation, by the Spirit, in other words. Amen. So it's a winnable war, and it's winnable because Jesus Christ has already won the victory for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. It's, it, it's a victory that we have, but... When you, think, when you think about what's, it, it seems like a contradiction, but Jesus has given us weapons as a result of that. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. And they are, they are infused with and energized by the very power of God. Now look at, look at Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold... There we go, Jason. Thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. That would be something to behold, yeah. something to get a hold of and hang on to and confess. Praise the Lord. Because that's the bottom line in every situation. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing. Praise the Lord. Now, just let me put this in here. When, when Jesus resisted the devil, he did it with words. The, the devil is under absolutely no obligation to obey your thoughts or your feelings or your knowledge. The only thing he has to obey are your words that are in agreement with God's word because it's as though God is speaking. He said, my word will not come back void. If it's spoken by a believer, it has to produce after its own kind. Praise the Lord. Bob Dylan had it right. 
You've got to serve somebody. Everybody's going to serve somebody. Praise God. And this war goes on because the enemy, as has already been said this morning, is committed to keeping the full revelation of the truth of what happened on that cross hidden from us. To just give us a taste of it, a little bit of it, some of it, but the totality of it, he needs to keep it. Amen? Look, look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4.4. 4. This is the unsaved. This is speaking to the unsaved. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Unless the revelation, amen, of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay, that's, that's the bad news. But the good news is, by the grace of God, we get Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So even though we were blind, God sent the light of the world to us and enlightened us that we might become the children of light. He sent the revelation of God to us so that we could then be a revelation of this Jesus Christ to a fallen world. Not only would we receive revelation, but we would be a revelation. Amen? So suddenly, here's what happens. The gospel moves from history to his story to my story. That's what God wants us to understand. Praise the Lord. It's about trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ as full payment for our sins. Praise the Lord. John chapter 8 and verse 32. And you'll know the truth. And the truth will make you free. So truth sets you free, and lies keep you in bondage. Praise God. Truth sets us, the truth of the gospel sets us free from the penalty of sin. Amen? And as great a, a revelation as that is, that's not all that was accomplished by Jesus on the cross. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, We've got to see that we died with Christ. We didn't just get our sins forgiven. We died with Christ. I know we accept that intellectually, but we don't. We, we really haven't gone there. At least I never have. I've never really had anybody take me further than that kind of superficial uh, teaching. Praise the Lord in Christ. We received new life. But before we could enter into that new life, the old me, the old you, had to die, had to be crucified. Praise the Lord. See, what I'm saying is we need revelation to be a continuous experience in our life. That's what the sharing is about. You never know. You think, well, this is... Surely everybody knows that. You have no idea that the things that come out of your mouth, I, I, I assume that you usually don't know, that there are people in here that don't know that. Amen. Amen? And there's things that that person who maybe doesn't know that says to me that I didn't know. Or at least it never rang true until I heard it coming from somebody else's lips. That's, there's revelation all the time. There can, there's no way there cannot be revelation in a child of light. There's no way you cannot, unless you hide your light under a bushel, and that's what we're trying not to do, hide it under a bed, any of that stuff. That's what we're trying to do in this church, I just briefly explained, is to let your light shine. Yes. It isn't about how good you are. It's about 
how, what good you have in you in Christ that needs to be revealed. If you get to the place where you're comfortable letting your light shine here, it will be more natural for it to shine wherever you are, where, in whatever situation you find yourself. Praise the Lord. So we need revelation to continue. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, I don't know about you, but I think sometimes we read scriptures like Galatians 2.20, you know, that I'm crucified with Christ and, and so on and so forth. And we, we read it and we think, what? I mean, what is he, what's he really saying? Well, then our religious teaching or worldly kind of uh, approach to those things says, oh, well, that's just, that's just positional truth. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. So it's not really me, you know. I mean, it's, it's this Jesus, and I'm just believing, and, and it's really not about me actually. Right. It's about me positionally. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's kind of the way we're led to believe a lot of times. Praise the Lord. So the Scripture, though, which is the Word of God, which is unadulterated, perfect, settled in heaven, says that you and I are the righteousness of God Amen. in Christ. To be in Christ simply means to believe in Christ. That's all there is to being in Christ is believing in him and you are in him, right? So the kind of religious world says, oh, it's just positional or whatever. But, but as was already said here this morning as well, See, God doesn't want to just inform us. He wants to transform us. Yes, yes. That's what this is all about. That's what he's trying to get us to understand. The truth of the word, has, the truth of this word right here, has the power to transform you today if you can believe it. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Think of it like this. If, if God sees us a certain way, then that's the way we are. Right? God's knowledge and wisdom is perfect. So however he sees me, that's how I am. I don't care how anybody else sees me, how I see myself. It has nothing to do with it. God's ways are perfect. They're just. They're true. They're righteous. They are absolute. His word doesn't change. If he says you're the righteousness of God in Christ, then you're the righteousness of God in Christ. Now we believe, we'll say, God said it. I believe it, therefore it is, Amen. unless it's referring to me personally, because <laughs> it's kind of a stretch there, you know, but those words are true. If God said it, it's a settled fact. Whether, it may take a thousand years for these scientists on this planet or, or men of knowledge to come into an agreement with it, but it's been settled. I mean, they thought the world was flat for several thousand years. I'm talking about the, 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 the world view. But the Bible was declaring it to be an orb and that the planets, you know, from the beginning. Just because it took them 3,500 years, 4,500 years, 6,000 years, whatever, to come to that realization didn't make it untrue. Praise the Lord. If, if God's word is true and whatever he says about us is true, then I think... Why can't we trust that what God says about us in his word is the truth? Yeah. If, his, if he's perfect, if his word is settled, then whatever he says about me, it's true. Yeah. Amen? Well, but my experience tells me that can't be true. My feelings, there's no way it can be true. But is the reality of what's true or untrue based on our limited experiences or our constantly changing emotions or on God's perfect, 
unchanging word. Amen? I mean, there are times I could believe for anything. And there are other times I have trouble believing anything. But it's because I'm, I'm, I'm the variable here. I'm basing on how I feel, what I'm experiencing, instead of on what the Word of God says. That's the discipline. That's the discipling that he talks about. It isn't about just be, keep on the straight and narrow and always do good. The discipline is right here. It's, it's getting the mind renewed so that you think the way God thinks. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 3 through 7. These are not new things for probably any of us here. But they're things that are undone, that are not finished in us. You know, I mean, they're finished in us, but they're not finished in the way that we perceive ourselves. So know ye not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Mm -hmm. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. <coughs> Praise God. Amen. So, what the scripture is telling us is that something has radically changed in you and me. Praise God. Because of what Christ did. We aren't just the same people that we used to be, amen, with eternal life slapped on it for good measure. Praise God. We are different. We are changed radically at the core. Different. Changed. Metamorphosized. Whether you feel it or don't feel it, whether you think it or rationalize it or not, that's what the Bible says happens to you the moment you become a believer. You are dead. You are crucified. You say, how can that be? The same way Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world, and we were in Christ before the foundation of the world. You were crucified. You were buried. You were resurrected. It can't be any other way for you to have what the Bible says you are to have. Amen. Praise God. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. These truths, we need, to, we need to tell ourselves and one another this over and over and over and over and over and over without ceasing because the enemy is, is doggedly, amen, committed to keeping you Blind to the truth of who you are in Christ and what God has done for you. Amen. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Praise the Lord. Out of that place that we talked about, amen, where the enemy has blinded us or veiled us to the truth, into a place where revelation shines. Amen. Where light shines all the time. And we become the light. We're not just recipients of the light. We end up being the light. Hallelujah. In this dark world. In this, amen, in this fallen world. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, that's not just verbiage. I mean, that's not just something nice to say. When you read that out of this Bible, that's God's word. That's the truth. It's not some homage to a particular denomination or religious belief. It is the truth. Yes. Yes. Praise God. We've been freed from sin's control. No longer its slaves. 
you're going to serve somebody. Uh -huh. Amen? And if you're blind, if you're still in darkness, you're a servant of sin. But if you've seen the light, praise the Lord, if you have received the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you become light. You are no longer a servant of sin. You are a servant of the light. Yes. In other words, you follow the revelation instead of the sin. Praise the Lord. I know. We, we tend to think of, of, you know, only our sins being somehow attached or placed on Christ. I heard somebody this morning on a Christian broadcast saying that. Your sins were placed on Jesus. And, and that's ten, the, we have a tendency to think that way. That somehow it's like God just hooked up the holy vacuum sweeper, <laughs> sucked my sin out, and somehow injected it into Christ. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's, a, that's not the whole picture. It's, it's not a clear picture. We ourselves, you and me, like our sins, amen, were placed on the cross with Jesus, apart from Jesus, but with Jesus, along with all of our sins. Now you say, that, this is what the Bible teaches. If you read it, if you read it, you'll find out you were crucified with him. Yes. Not symbolically, not metaphorically, in the mind of God before the foundation of the world, we and our sins were crucified with Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. I know everything we've ever thought, everything, it's all going round and round in our heads right now trying to make, you know, make sense. When Jesus died, we died with him. Yes. When Jesus was buried, we were buried with him. Yes. Baptism is the symbol. Right. The reality has already taken place. When Jesus rose from the dead, you rose with him. Amen. Amen. And when you rose with him, you rose a new creature. Yes. Yes. Spiritually alive, set free from sin's control. People. Yes. God people. Yes. Dead to sin. Me? <laughs> You've got to be kidding I sin every day, all day, and I spend what little time I'm not sinning focused on trying not to sin. Yeah. You might as well say we're, we're dead to air. <laughs> but to start with, we need to know and understand what dead to sin does and doesn't mean. First of all, it doesn't mean that you no longer sin. Right. As believers, we all still sin. And anybody who says they doesn't is sinning. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. They're lying. Yeah. Second, being dead to sin doesn't mean that temptation doesn't happen. Right. Uh, Hebrews 4.15 talks about Jesus being tempted uh -huh. like as we all are, just like any human. Because he was a human. Yeah. You say, not Jesus. Oh, yeah. He had thoughts. Yeah. He had temptations. He just didn't yield to them. Praise. Praise the Lord. Being dead to sin means you are actually, really, genuinely, no longer alive to it. Praise. I know that's pretty deep. <laughs> but that's what the scripture teaches. Titus chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 11 through 15. See, we can't get our, it's difficult to get your head around this idea of actually you were crucified with Christ and that you died and that what you're seeing here is not 
what it used to be. The external, the external, the sarks, as you say, is still the same. But that was never you anyhow. That was just an earth suit. That was just a that was just a your ticket to ride this, on this planet. It makes you legal here. But you were a spirit, and I always have been. You were just dead to God. You got born again, your spirit was made alive to God. This thing didn't change. It's the same as it's always been. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's God works. That's agreeing with God. Amen? Now, is there anything in those verses, I mean, really, if you don't approach it from where we've always come from in the past, is there anything in those verses about following a list of rules or regulations in order to stop sin? No. Because Christianity is about relationship, not scrupulous adherence to rules and regulations. Yes. Right. Right. Religiously, we think, well, oh, if I could only, and I mean, I've been here. If I could only have some kind of a spiritual experience. You know, if I could just go, we used to call it praying through. If I could just go get in a meeting somewhere where I would just get covered with goosebumps and freak out and see a vision or lose my mind and pass out or something, something that I could say, now, I've had the experience. I've been changed. That's what religion does to us. Even though it may be well motivated, it still gives us a, a, a screwed up image of what God is doing. So we want this spiritual experience that will make it true for me. Because somebody else said they had one that made it true for them. And maybe they did and maybe they didn't. The truth is that the only experience that you require already occurred 2,000 years ago. That's what the Bible's trying to tell. I'm not against exuberance, shouting, or anything else because I've done it all and continue to do it. I'm just saying... That is my human emotion responding to something that is just greater than I know how to deal with in the natural. Right? And it's good. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying, but in some circles, Pentecostal, charismatic, we have made those the highlights. We've made them the goal. We've made them, that's what I got to have. I got to have one more whammo with Jesus. I got to have one more knockout. I got to have one more... Goosebump, i got to have one more, one more something when I've already had the only one thing that ever needed to happen for me to be transformed into the likeness of God. Hallelujah. And that happened 2,000 years ago, amen, when I hung on that cross with Him. Jesus paid the price for my sin, but I was there. I was there, and you were there. That's what God said. Praise God. When Jesus died on the cross, we died with him by faith. Yes. It wasn't even my faith. It was the faith of Jesus that placed me there with him. Yes. That made it possible. Yes. Faith is simply saying amen to whatever God has said about it. Yes. It's that simple. It isn't something we conjure up and, and, and get great. No, it's saying, so be it. That's what amen. God said, by my stripes you're healed. So be it. Had nothing, had nothing to do with me. It's just my saying yes to what God has already done. Which is what everybody's been saying here this morning, right? Christ's death freed us from being controlled by laws. Period. Now think about that. Because it's not just the laws, religious laws, but it's freed us from the law of gravity. If, if, if we, could, we could walk on water the same as Jesus, 
Oh, you say, now you're really getting out there. I, we'll take baby steps, but I'm just saying, yeah. this is what he said. Now, if you're, you've been amen, right. so don't, don't get goofy now. It freed us from every law. Yes. Not just the law of religion. But I used to say to my mother, I hope I live forever and you never die. You know, that's possible. In fact, it's not just possible. It's a reality. Because once unbelief has been eradicated from this earth, the enemy, shut up. Guess what happens? People just like us will live forever. Yes. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible teaches. Yes. And, a, and a person of 100 or 150 years old will be like a baby. Yeah. Come on. In terms of their longevity. That's just during the thousand year millennial. And then after we move from the millennium into, and there'll be living people on this planet, living just like you and I are, 40, 50, 60, 70, whatever years they are, and they'll move right into the millennium and they'll never die. And the truth is, you and I will never die. Right. We just think we're going to die because this thing yeah. goes into the ground yeah. or gets burned up or whatever we end up deciding to do with it. Yeah. But we don't. Right. We'll be more conscious, more aware, more in tune, amen, than we have ever been or could ever hope to be while we're in a body. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 7, <clears throat> verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are come, have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Yes. For the Lord. We were taken from under the law system and we got born again, and the moment we got born again, we were put under the grace system. Uh -huh. The law system doesn't even exist for us. Exactly. It's, it's a non-factor. It's dead. Yes. It's the previous husband. Yes. Yep. Praise the Lord. Yep. It, you know, what we need to do, instead of having another revival, we need to have a funeral yeah. for the ex, yeah. uh -huh. for the late Husband. People, but there'd be more people set free with a revelation of that and have an understanding of that than all the revivals that we could ever have that just hype us up and pump us up and then get us back out in the world and we're back under the same load of, of fear and anxiety and stress and everything else because we've never understood that there was only one really true revival. We died with Christ and were revived. Hallelujah. We were made alive again. Yes. Hallelujah. In newness of life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want you to see what our, you know, we know what the old, the ex-husband said. Yeah. He was a jerk. You know, just a <laughs> controlling freak. I've heard, you know, we always hear that from, you know, have you ever dated, you know? Oh, my last boyfriend was just a total <laughs> jerk. Something happens, you know, they were all jerks, but Okay, let's move on. <laughs> anyway, he was. He was, a, he was a manipulator, a control freak, a, a constant, you know, in your face complaining. Just, that's what the old husband was. 
But look, look at, let's look, just look at the new husband for just one moment in uh, Jude, uh, Jude verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Hallelujah. That's the new husband. Praise the Lord. Amen. One more scripture here and then we'll, we'll all wrap it up. Uh, John 8 and verse 44. The devil is a liar. Yes. Amen. Amen. Ye are of your father, you speaking to the Jews, and, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Yes. So the devil, here's, here's the devil's game plan. He doesn't want you to believe anything in the Bible really applies to you. It's always for somebody else. Oh, well, it may work for them, but it, that's his whole scheme. It's, and the way that he makes it work is by getting you into a sense of the law yeah. to where I'm not worthy to have right. this. Right. So he can't deny that here's what it says. So he tries to keep you from believing it's applicable to you. Yeah, it might be good for the people that are doing all the good stuff, but, you know, my, my, I'm a mess, and so it, it's not for me. That's what he does. He attacks you constantly with this idea that you cannot expect to deserve any of this. That's the beauty of grace. Of course we don't deserve it. It's a gift. It's free. It's from God because he's declared us to be righteous, holy, spotless, amen, perfect in the eyes of God. Now, if that's what he says, then that's what we are. Yes. Praise God. Okay, here we go. It's movie time. <laughs> Hook. Remember when you were a kid? When I was a kid, it was Larry Hagman's mother. It was Peter Pan. Mary Martin. You didn't know that. That's a little tribute for you. I pretended not to see the ropes. <laughs> when she, why, Peter Pan, yeah. Well, then along come Robin Williams yes. and Dustin Hoffman. Yes. And they make this movie called Hook. It's Peter Pan. Well, I was thinking about this the other day. Why, I have no idea. Could have been the medication I was on, I'm not sure. <laughs> But uh, Robin Williams is uh, a grown-up Peter Pan. He's actually Peter Panning is his name. And he's a workaholic, and he neglects his family for his career. He's just, that's his whole focus. And at first, he denies his identity as Peter Pan. Now, he's an adult now. And then, through a series of events, he returns to Never Never Land. Mm -hmm. And after some difficulty and time and things happen, he finally regains his ability to fly and to fight. Mm -hmm. Now Captain Hook, Dustin Hoffman in the movie, is this evil deceiver. Yeah. And he, in the final fight scene, Hook has Pan up against a wall, and he's ready to kill him. And Hook says, you know you're not really Peter Pan. This is only a dream. When you wake up, you'll just be Peter Panning. Cold, selfish, man who drinks too much, obsessed with success, who runs and hides from his wife and children. And Peter's getting weaker and weaker, and he's, you know, all this is going through his head. And then all the lost boys. How could we forget the lost boys? They all start going, we believe in you, Peter Pan. I mean, I know it's simpy, but it, it's the movie, you know. We believe in you, Peter Pan. We believe in you. And then finally, little Tinkerbell. I believe in you, Peter Pan. 
I believe in you, Peter Pan. And then Peter defeats Captain Hook. And that's our enemy. He's always reminding us of our failures, Come on. of our weaknesses, of our sins, trying to make you believe a lie. In Jesus, we are all children of God. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are the glory of God in this world, the manifestation of God in this world. And God says, I believe in you. How can I not believe in you? Because you are in me, and I'm in you. And that's the truth that sets us free. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise the Lord. And I think it's appropriate that we realize that sometimes we need to hear it from other people. Sometimes we need to hear it from people around us. We need to, we need to say it to other people. We need to share it. And that's what's so important about us coming together. In the last days especially. Because how can they ever be the last days, the true last days, when the body rises up and does what it does, unless we come together, unless we support one another, unless we, I believe in you, Jason. You know, I, I believe in you, Jody. I believe in you, Diane, Suzanne. You know, I know who you are. I know what you're capable of. And I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what the people say. I don't care what other people say. I don't care what other churches say. I believe in you because how can you not be this if Christ is in you? I'm not looking at a bunch of old fixed up, painted up, uh, spruced up, dead people that have eternal life strapped to their leg that they're dragging around. We, we are t- totally new creatures, radically, totally, magnificently changed yes. by Jesus Christ. Yes. And if God says it, let God be true yes. and every man a liar. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a great week. Make it supernatural because that's what you are. Hallelujah. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.